Welcome everybody to the Aqua Hacking 2021 Western Canada Challenge. My name is Anna Warwick Sears, the Executive Director of the Okanagan Basin Water Board. We're co-hosting this challenge and I'll be your MC for the next hour or so. I'm broadcasting today from Kelowna, British Columbia, the unceded traditional territory of the Silks Okanagan people. Since we have folks joining us from all across Canada, we want to invite you to log into the chat and just tell us where you're joining from. Now, the Okanagan Basin Water Board is very proud to be hosting the Aqua Hacking Challenge for the second time, and this year, including all Western provinces in Canada. We're one big family. I want to congratulate all the teams who have taken up the challenge this year to solve some of our most pressing water problems. We're really glad that you can join us online today. The Aqua Hacking Challenge is a tech forward program and this event shows how we can leverage our tech agility to continue working towards saving fresh water. Now I want to welcome a very good friend, Carrie Ann Arup, who's the director of Aqua Hacking at Aqua Forum and the other co-host of the Western Canada Challenge. So welcome Carrie Ann. Thank you, Anna. Let me also extend a warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the entire Aquahacking team and our board. I myself am joining you today from Victoria on the unceded territory of the Lekwungen people known as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. We are so glad to have you all with us at this Aquahacking Western Canada Challenge semi-final. It was this time last year that we had to pivot quickly from in-person to virtual, and as much as we miss being together with all of you in person, we do see the benefits of coming together virtually, with participants joining us today from across the country and beyond. Just as our fresh water is connected across jurisdictions and beyond borders, so too are we connected, thanks to technology, in our efforts to work to restore and preserve the health of our fresh waters. When I look back at the six years of programming, I am truly amazed at how far the original idea of an aqua hacking challenge has come. There was a time when tech innovation, a tech innovation challenge for freshwater was a bit of an eccentric idea. Today, however, we better understand the potential of technology to play an important role for our shared objectives of restoring and continuing to ensure healthy freshwater. The 28 water tech startups that have come from the past challenges and are still active across the country today are a testament to that. The semi-final is an important milestone in our program where we see all the hard work and the groundbreaking ideas of the over 100 talented young Canadians who have registered for the Western Challenge and have been working on their solutions for the past months. To all of you, I say thank you for your commitment and focus on such an important issue for our country our communities, our ecosystems, for our future. It is this next generation of Canadians like you who will lead us to a brighter, better future with your ideas, your out-of-the-box thinking, your deep care for the environment, and your commitment to succeed. It takes a lot of people to make all of this happen, this event and the program and everything leading up to it. And I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to all. To the team at OBWB, our co-host and partner and with whom we very much enjoy working. To the judges who will have the difficult task of evaluating between all of the team's pitches to select the finalists. Thank you for bringing your expertise to this process. And to our funders and sponsors, without whose support and belief, none of this would be possible. Each of you in your respective roles is playing a very important part in making a difference for the future of fresh water in Canada. Without further ado, let me close by saying good luck to all the teams on behalf of our board and our virtual extended team in Montreal, Kelowna, Toronto, and Victoria. Thank you so much to everybody. Back to you, Anna. Thank you, Carrie Ann. And now I want to welcome our guest speaker, Marilyn Ann Fair. Marilyn Ann is a lawyer, author, and she's the founding executive director of the Center for Indigenous Environmental Resources, a national First Nations charitable organization. Marilyn Ann is also a commissioner 
on the International Joint Commission, and she's co-convener of the Collaborative Leadership Initiative in Manitoba. She was the chief negotiator on behalf of the government of Northwest Territories in their negotiation of transboundary water agreements in the Mackenzie River Basin and for the creation of Tai Dene Nene, a national and territorial park on the east arm of the Great Slave Lake. She's a member of Smart Prosperity, a member of the Forum for Leadership on Water, and as a recipient of the Clean 50 Award. She's also legal counsel and advisor for a number of First Nations governments and regularly speaks on governance, water, and rights issues. And last but not least, we also have the privilege to have her on our Aqua Hacking Advisory Committee this year. So a warm welcome to Merrill Ann. So in my time with you today, I would like to talk to you about hope. And so where do we start? We are 14 months into a pandemic. And it's not surprising that the most common conversation I have has to do with despair and hope. I am frequently asked whether I have hope. And at times like this, it is hard to know how to do that. I know that the human propensity is to look around and see the negative, And there's certainly a lot to see if you want to. Um, I recently in prep for this spoke with a really wise friend of mine who's funny and I asked her about her thoughts on hope and she just stopped and looked at me and said, hope? Hope is a four letter word. Any questions? So um, I will <laughs> um, be honest with you about my views on hope and you can decide. So where are we? Well, I think we could agree that things are generally grim. Some are more short-term grim like COVID and others are more long-term existential dread type grid like climate change and species extinction, pretty massively grim. Um, we know that regarding like the short-term grim that the world may have changed, but that, um, but that we'll, we'll get through it um, changed. There are terrible things that have happened, but that are also there are also some good things that have happened, like um, not to minimize the negative, of course, but COVID has been a major market disruptor. It has this is leading to unprecedented levels of innovation. Also, people around the world are finding new ways to address their need for interconnectedness, particularly look in the arts and music scenes on YouTube. Um, there have been massive transformations in education, and many of you parents are living through that. Um, the pandemic is also very importantly, I think, giving us a sense of appreciation and gratefulness. It's we are developing or have a new perspective on everything we may have taken for granted for maybe too long, like our freedoms, um, work, our connectedness, our connections with people we love, family and friends. Um, I. I guess a personal one, I'm not traveling anymore, which is great because I traveled too much for my work and I'm so happy to be at home more. And, and yet, okay, enough of that. Let's get back to um, long-term existential dread because that's the one that impacts hope. Um, so where are we? Based on the science, it seems that humans have pushed the world system too far. That's how I look at it. What we do, does not seem like it will be enough to take it back, take the world back to how it was. Um, the world as we knew it, I think is forever gone. And I know that change is a constant, but this change that we are living through is much too fast. It's human caused, it's very disruptive, and it's very traumatic. We are now living in the new abnormal. There is no normal. And for me, it brings massive amounts of um, grief and fear. And it has actually for some time. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story. You know, when I was in my uh, late 20s, early 30s, I, I mean, so I've been working at the nexus of Indigenous environmental issues since my late 20s. And very early on, I found myself asking, what am I doing um, this uh, there's just so many terrible losses. It's so hard for one person to see any success that you've done anything in the world. The systems collapse seems to be happening around me. It's just 
filled with existential dread. Like, where is the hope in that? Where is my effectiveness as a person? Um, and so things kept building in that arena. Those questions did not go away and they got bigger and more powerful. And it was in my mid thirties that I had, it all really came to a head and I had a real crisis moment about the value of work and priorities in the face of climate change and whether change was possible at all. And I was very depressed and it resulted in complete immobility on the couch for over a week, just no movement. And, you know, at that time we didn't have Netflix to binge on and just use to avoid until all the feelings pass. It's so much easier now, <laughs> but, um, anyway, I, I sat there, I remember lying there rather on the couch and kind of having these conversations with myself about like, I said, I feel such despair. And I replied, I worry it'll be for nothing. And I wish it need not have happened in my time, I said. So do I, I replied. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Now, if you think that sounded a little bit like Gandalf and Frodo, you're very astute. That was Gandalf and Frodo. They expressed it much better than um, I did at the time, and so I will use them. Um, but I did, I did look at it like this, like I kind of worked it out my way, which is thinking, we've got about eight or so decades on this planet. I've probably used up two or three, well, we used up about three and a bit already. Um, the last couple ones probably won't use on this kind of stuff, and so maybe I've got a solid three to four decades to play with. What am I gonna do? I had to admit to myself that it was unlikely that any one of us, and by any one of us I meant me, was going to be able to save the world. So I needed to think deeply about my personal, unique, to myself role in this unfolding drama. And I understood that I had inherited a world that I hadn't created, both the good and the bad, and there were very serious problems with it. but. The world was now under my watch as well, like as everyone else now, under our watch. By the latter end of that week, um, I came to the conclusion about my role. And I discovered, unearthed that my role in this drama is as a witness and a bridge. That's my truth. I figured it out and I chose to accept it. It was a very um, significant realization for me to figure out that the role of witness was important and that that was my role as a witness. And um, this is what I do. I watch, I experience, I learn, I consider, I reflect. Um, and yes, I grieve deeply um, a lot of what I see. But, but also, here's the kicker. Um, in addition to being a witness to, you know, the end of the world as we know it, I came to also understand that I needed to do something anyway. I was going, what was I going to do on my watch? Um, so what I do is I'm an advocate and that's what I do. I'm an advocate because it's what I like, it's what I want to do. I have some skills in that area. I have residual issues with authority, which work out well. Uh, as a lawyer. I like words. I like ideas. I sometimes can be good at translating, explaining concepts that others are having some difficult time seeing their way through, like rights or reconciliation or governance. But, but to be clear, this is my role regardless of the outcome. For me, this role exists whether I approach it from a hopeful place or a more gothic place. It just is what it is. It's not because I actually think I'll make a difference. That's me, right? Gothic. But my personal view is things are gone pretty too far. But that, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all, actually. Because through the work I do, I believe that I honor the things and the events and the people that I witness. And I don't know at the end of my life or at the end of time what that witnessing 
might result in. We can't know the future. But what matters to me is that I am a witness and that I am the person I want to be through it all. That's, that's where it's settled for me. Now, if you, on the other hand, are the, on the more like optimistic, uh, things are not so grim end of the spectrum, it comes, spectrum rather, it comes a little bit more naturally for you, then things are a bit different. You may feel like things are dire, but actually fixable. Um, maybe through technology, law reform, uh, science, reconciliation, or, or other things, whatever you do, arts, you, but you do those things. And um, regardless of hope, you still need to do something. We need to act. Because those who act might make progress. And we certainly won't make progress without it. So, luckily, and here's the amazing thing, Action creates hope. Action, in my experience, having lived through deciding to do it, action is the life force of hope. And it is the antidote to despair. And I have seen it. It gives purpose and meaning. I mean, hope without action is, it's uh, like, it's escapism, it's illusion. It's self-indulgence of the most tragic kind. Um, you need action. Either way, the more naturally of us way or through action, whatever you way, there is hope. There is hope. And as a quick aside, um, those things that, those things, those hope things tend to go better if you have some kind of plan, an action plan. But also remember what, um, I've lived through this. The, bo the boxer Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. So you must <laughs> be prepared to pivot, change your plan, try something else, because as you, implement, as you implement a plan, almost immediately you will be forced to do something different, to change. But that's okay, because being nimble is a skill you can develop. It's a muscle that will get stronger over time. Um, the big point is this. Whether at this moment you are like me and naturally identify dark and edgy pessimism as your superpower, or you are a bit more fun to be around and more easily choose hope, we end up in the same place, which is hope is a choice, action creates hope, needs action, breeds more hope, generates more action, creates change, builds the future. Even if that change is incremental and time consuming, consuming and requires many forms of action from many directions, it doesn't matter. So I'd like to end by congratulating you all on making it to the semifinals in the Western Canada Aqua Hacking Challenge. And I wish you the best of luck in your presentations. Regardless of how you may look at things you are clearly all choosing to do something you are trying something. And so whether or not you even recognize it, you are choosing hope. Hope is not a comfortable or easy choice. Hope is not about peace of mind. Hope involves personal risk because you are actually choosing, I'm going to try. Hope is a noun, but it is also a verb. Hope is an action, it is a choice. It is yours to make and yours to do. And the secret is to do it consciously. And so finally, as you make this choice, probably over and over and over again in your life, as we keep moving through these challenging times, I ask you to think about the words of Ursula Le Guin, who was a pioneering science fiction writer who imagined amazing worlds in her writing. And she said, a moral choice in its basic terms appears to be a choice that favors survival, a choice made in favor of life. Good luck. Thank you, Marilyn. Ann. It's always really inspiring to hear your thoughts. Now, I want to introduce Carolina Restrepo, coordinator of the challenge, who's here with me on Silk's territory in Kelowna. She's going to present a recap of the 2021 challenge so far. 
So welcome, Carolina. Thank you, Anna, and good afternoon, everybody. I am honored to present a recap of the challenge. The planning of the challenge began back in October 2020 with the formation of the advisory committee, a group formed by experts in different sectors who volunteered their time and energy to support the selection and refinement of the four water issues, as well as the water issue leader selection, recommending potential mentors to support the teams and potential judges for the semifinal, promoting the challenge events, and helping in general with this program instrumentation. Thanks again for all your help and support. In terms of the timeline, the challenge was officially launched in January when the four water issues were announced and registration opened. The teams at OBWB and Aqua Hacking developed a recruiting campaign that included reaching to universities, colleges, and young professionals all around Western Canada. This campaign was supported by virtual info sessions, ask me anything sessions, social media campaigns, among others. Once participants registered, they were invited to form their teams, select the water issue they were going to tackle, and to begin working in their solutions. At the same time, they had access to workshops in areas such as design thinking, pitch perfect among others, and mentorship opportunities with water issue leaders. Registration closed on April 15, then teams had about a month to continue working and improving their projects. Once the top four teams are announced today, they will begin phase two of the challenge. That includes workshops, mentorship, and each finalist will receive a $2,000 bursary to continue working in their solution. Winners will be announced on September 14. After that, all four will begin their startup incubation process and the seed funding will be disembursed. Four relevant water issues to Western Canada were selected to be tackled in this challenge. Optimization of drinking water and wastewater treatment plants, supported by Robert Heller, Executive Director at the Canadian Water and Wastewater Association, and David Tisdale, Professor at the Okanagan College. On-farm nutrient capture and recycling, supported by Mary McRae, Professor at the University of Waterloo, Maggie Rommel, Executive Director at the Canadian Water Resources Association, and David Love, Professor at the University of Manitoba. Toxic algal blooms, supported by Helen Bolch, assistant professor at the University of Saskatchewan, and innovative social technologies for water information, supported by Gabrielle Parent-Doliné, director of Water Rangers, and Graham Strickert, assistant professor at the University of Saskatchewan. Thanks to all our water issue leaders for the amount of work you have done for this challenge. Now let's talk about our challenge participants and their profiles. 137, participants register, 79% of them are undergraduate students, 13% graduated students, and 8% young professionals. All of them form 21 teams, and most of them pitch during the semifinal session. In terms of geographical location, 78% of the participants came from Western provinces, such as BC, Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, and the remaining 22% from other provinces such as Ontario and Quebec. And considering that most universities are virtual for this year, we have a good number of participants enrolled in Canadian universities participating in the challenge from other countries in Central and South America, Asia, and Africa. The top four teams that will be announced today will be competing in September for the following prizes. In seed funding, the first place will get $20,000, the second $15,000, the third $10,000, and the fourth place $5,000. Each finalist team gets a spot in a local startup incubator. The top three teams are awarded credits for legal services from labor lawyers. And if the team is eligible, they can access additional funds available to MyTax. And I can finish these presentations without mentioning the teams behind Aqua Hacking and the OBWB. Thanks, Corian in Victoria, and Pascal, Melissa, and Lawrence in Montreal. And also, thanks to Anna, James, and Corinne here at the OBWB. Finally, we are also proud to be working with implementation partners, including Okanagan WaterWise, Hackworks, WaterLution, and Foresight. Back to you, Anna. Thank you, Carolina. What an amazing journey. I want to say the Aqua Hacking Challenge really wouldn't be possible without the support of our sponsors. The challenge was initiated by the De Gaspe Bobian Foundation. 
It's powered by the RBC Foundation through their Tech for Nature Fund. And it's also supported by Ovivo, Lavery Lawyers, MyTax, the Okanagan Basin Water Board, of course, and Tech Resources. And now, the, on this occasion, I want to welcome two representatives of our major partners. The RBC Foundation has been a longtime supporter of aqua hacking, and thanks to them, aqua hacking was able to become Pan Canadian. To tell you more about this partnership, I want to invite Brian Hong, who's the Senior Manager for Social Impact of the RBC Tech for Nature Fund. Welcome, Brian. Hi everyone, my name is Brian Hong and I'm a senior manager with RBC Corporate Citizenship and the portfolio lead for RBC Tech for Nature. Our multi-year commitment to preserving the world's natural ecosystem by fostering new ideas, technologies, and partnerships focused on protecting our shared future. This year, we're extremely grateful that programs such as the Aqua Hacking Challenge are able to continue thanks to virtual programming. RBC has been a longtime supporter of the Aqua Hacking Challenge, and now more than ever, our planet needs the talent and commitment of young Canadians to develop solutions for one of our most precious resources, fresh water. That you all have chosen to participate in this solutions-focused program, despite the trying circumstances in which we all live, is a testament to your resilience and commitment to build back a better world. It truly gives us all a lot of hope. With 28 startups that are up and running from the previous aqua hacking challenges, we see what's possible when technology innovation is coupled with the ingenuity, the bright minds of the many university students and recent graduates that register for the aqua hacking challenge. This remarkable program has filled a gap in the water tech development pipeline in Canada and is a much needed bridge between academia, government, the tech sector and civil society in a time when collaboration is key to solving the complex climate change issues that we face. To all the teams that pitched their solution, I want to thank you for making a difference for freshwater solutions in Canada and wish you the best of luck in the competition. Thank you. With the origin story of the Aqua Hacking Challenges, there is a Quebec Family Foundation, the De Gaspe Bobien Foundation. Back in 2015, they came up with this idea of a challenge for young people and new technologies to contribute to the water sector. It was new at the time. Seven years later with this challenge, we're very proud to present the ninth edition. To talk more about it, I wanna invite one of the absolute pillars of aqua hacking, the executive director of the De Gaspe Bobien Foundation, Dominique Monchamp. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. So once again, the De Gaspe Bobien Foundation is very, very proud to, to support aqua hacking in Western Canada. Aqua hacking has been there last year for Lake Winnipeg and also in Kelowna. And um, we've built uh, strong partnerships in different sectors, such as uh, um, academia sector or government or even the community sector. And because of that, uh, now we can say that aqua hacking is a coast to coast movement in Canada and, and working very hard to uh, emerge some solutions um, for water uh, issues. So again, OBWB is there uh, to run the aqua hacking in Western Canada. OBWB is the best partner we can imagine. They are working hard. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they are a strong team working together. And also they truly believe in tech solutions and they truly believe in, in this young generation. And they put all their efforts uh, to make it happen. So it's, it's just fun to work with you guys. So a big, big, big thank you. <clears throat> I would like also to thank uh, uh, the young students uh, who registered or participated to this year challenge. You know, not easy right now to commit to any cause uh, besides uh, COVID. And um, uh, because of that, we 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 we're so appreciative of of your hard work and 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 commitment so you're uh, you are the heart of uh, of this movement so a huge thank you to all of you 
I, of course, I can't go without thanking the team of Aqua Forum, all the team behind Aqua Hacking, uh, Carrie Ann, Anne Pascal, Melissa, Laurence. A huge thank you to all of you. I love you deeply. And I know that, that you work hard and that you don't count hours. You, you're always there. So a big thank you to all of you too. Now, uh, it's the semi-final, so uh, I wish the best of luck to all of you. And uh, the, the Gaspé Beaubien Foundation support you now and will support you in the future as well. So, so keep going. Um, back to you, Anna. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dominique. And thanks again to all our sponsors and implementation partners that make this challenge possible. Since the first challenge in 2015, there's been more than 30 startups and initiatives that have emerged from aqua hacking, 28 of which are still active across Canada. So today we're pleased to welcome two of them. Let me start with the winner of the 2020 BC aqua hacking challenge, O0 Solutions. Please join me in welcoming Matisse Tessier, a co-founder and funding manager it's a real pleasure to have you with us today, Matisse. Thanks, Anna, for the introduction. I'm Matisse Stacy, co-founder of Ozero Solution and winner of the Aqua Hacking 2020 in BC. At Ozero Solution, we sell innovative boat washing station in order to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species in lakes. It's very important to do so, as invasive species destroy the ecosystems and the economy of municipalities around lakes. Since last year's Aqua Hacking, we're, we were able to finish all the tests on fields that we talked about, where we made great connections with potential clients. We then finished our bachelor's degree and officially launched our business, which is very nice. We've currently locked down a contract with Investissement Québec, an investing firm in Quebec, and La Ville de Montremagog for the installation of two washing stations around this year and next year. We also plan on exporting our product as soon as possible as we know invasive species are a threat outside of Quebec. We mainly want to focus on counties that are actively fighting the spread of aquatic invasive species in the United States, like Michigan and Utah. Aquahacking made us realize how important our problematic was and that our solution was essential for lakes. It was really the push we needed to officially start our business. I encourage you all to try and push your solution a little bit further outside of the Aquahacking Hopefully, it will land in a great market and end up working out for you. Have a very nice day and enjoy the, the ceremonies. Here's back to you, Anna. Thank you and merci, Matisse. We're looking forward to seeing your solution being put to work across Western Canada. Now I'd like to introduce Michael Beck, who's the CTO from Particuli Technologies and the winner of the 2020 Lake Winnipeg Aqua Hacking Challenge. So welcome, Michael. Hello, Aqua Hackers, and thank you, Anna, for the introduction. So I want to talk to you about what happened at Particular Technologies since the semifinals in 2020. And let me start by expressing my thanks to the Aqua Hacking community, because you guys are awesome. You helped us so much in bringing us together with the right experts to really refine our product and push our prototype forwards into the finals. This is really key and where we are today. So in December 2020, we incorporated Particular Technologies and we also launched our homepage, Particular.com. This is super exciting because it marks the beginning of our business endeavors. In January 2021, we participated in the Northwatch Incubator Program, which is all about customer research. So we were talking to a lot of customers and we made sure that the solutions we offer really fit the needs and problems of our customers. This eventually resulted in us presenting our product for the first time to a potential customer in April this year, which was very exciting and we got amazing feedback from that experience. In February 2021, we launched our MyTex uh, proposal with the University of Manitoba. And this project also started in April this year. So we had been really busy the last couple of weeks. I could tell much more, but let me cut it short here and just address the teams directly. I know how you guys are feeling. 
one year ago, we had been sitting in the same spot. So my advice to you is really channel this excitement, put your best foot forward and present us your amazing ideas. You never know where it will end. And with that being said, back to you, Anna. Listening to both Mattis and Michael makes us really proud. You're such an inspiration right now for all the semifinalists participating today. You see, the aqua hacking adventure does not end with the final. There's this post challenge phase, which is super critical for the further development of all of these initiatives. So to understand how the winners and the former participants of aqua hacking are supported after their involvement in a challenge, I invite the manager of the aqua hacking alumni program to speak. Lissa Dick, you're up. Thanks so much, Anna. Hi, everyone, and congratulations for making it this far to today's semifinal pitch competition. My name is Melissa Dick, and I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Kenyan Kahaga and the Anishinaabe peoples, also known as Montreal, Quebec, or Montreal, Quebec, uh, La Belle Province. I am the Aquahacking Alumni Program Manager, and I have the great pleasure of working with Matisse and his team at O0 Solutions as well as with Michael and his team at Particulite Technologies, as well as the other teams that have gone through the aqua hacking challenges over the past six years to continue to support their amazing work and development as young water tech startups. So I'm joining you today, not only to say good luck in today's semifinal pitch competition, but also to give you a glimpse into what awaits you on the other side of the semifinal, regardless of whether you finish as the top four or not. Um, all finalist and semi-finalist teams are welcomed into the Aquahacking Alumni Network. You've come this far and you've laid a strong foundation upon which you're building a brilliant water tech solution. And we want to help you give you any resources and tools and guidance that you may need to continue working on this project, even if you don't land in the top four after today's announcement. You know it, I know it, watersheds across Western Canada and indeed across the country are impacted by issues that affect the health of our water, which in turn impact the health of our communities. So the solution that you've developed is needed and we want to see it evolve past this pitch competition and be implemented on the ground and to help those in need. That is why we have the Aqua Hacking Alumni Community to continue to support the development of these emerging water tech solutions and you as young water leaders so that collectively we can make a significant positive impact on how water resources are managed and protected across Canada. So you will hear from me soon following today's top four announcement to invite you to join the Aquahacking Alumni Network. I'm here as your coach, I'm that person that can connect you to whoever, whoever you may need to talk to uh, to advance on next steps in your solution development or even just someone to bounce ideas off of. Myself and Matisse and Michael and the rest of the members of the Aquahacking Alumni community are super excited to have you join and be part of this growing network of young innovators across the country who are stepping up to the plate and making a real concrete difference for fresh water. There are 27 water tech startups and initiatives that were established through the Aquahacking challenges over the past six years that continue to be active to this day from coast to coast. And we look forward to having you join uh, and have your team join the alumni community to add to that number. I can't wait to hear the top four announcement, but perhaps even more importantly, I can't wait to connect with every single uh, semi-finalist team in the coming weeks to welcome you into the Aquahacking alumni community to learn more about your solution and see how I can help you in keeping your project growing and evolving and developing and keeping you engaged as a young water leader following today's event. So without further ado, I will pass it back to Anna. Thank you, Melissa. We're getting close to announcing the top four finalist teams that are gonna to move to phase two of the challenge. But before that, I want to introduce the amazing group of judges responsible for selecting finalists and evaluating the teams under the criteria of business potential, technical feasibility and functionality, innovation, and water use efficacy. And by that, I mean how well each solution addresses the water issue and meets the needs of the stakeholders. For our business judges, 
first is Davin Bodro, who's a senior policy analyst with Western Economic Diversification. Then we have Nicole Dalton, who's the Kelowna Community Manager for RBC. Duncan Phillips, the Vice President of Strategic Markets for MyTax. And finally, Charity Joy, the founder of 30 Turtle. Our tech judges are Mudit Gangal, Product Manager for Ovivo, Shannon Wilson, GBS Partner, Energy and Mining with IBM Canada, Isabel Peltier with Lavery Lawyers, and Andrew Greer, another Kelowna resident, who's the Managing Director and Co-Founder of Purple. For our Water and Environment judges, First off, we have Marta Green, who's a senior hydrologist of Associated Environmental Consulting, Claire Jackson, the COO for Water Smart Solutions, Carolyn Dubois, Executive Director, the Water Program for the Gordon Foundation, and finally, Pauline Girard, Deputy Director of IISD ELA. And thanks again to all of our judges for their time and dedication selecting the top four teams. Now the moment has arrived and we're ready to announce our four finalist teams. For the most important announcement of the day, I would like to introduce Kat Kavanaugh, co-founder and CEO of Water Rangers and winner of the 2015 Aqua Hacking Challenge. She's also one of our advisory committee members for this year's Western Canada Aqua Hacking Challenge. Welcome, Kat. I can't wait to hear what you have to announce. Thanks so much, Anna. It's my pleasure to be here. I started this journey as part of the hackathon for Aqua Hacking in 2015. And since then, we've been growing exponentially. Water Rangers dream is that every water body, everyone around those water bodies has the tools they need to understand if they're healthy or not. And it has been my passion since then to make that happen. Uh, this year, we are growing exponentially. Our, our team is full, is full of talented, wonderful people. There's seven of us right now, and we're just launching our newest test kit. Check out this backpack. So Water Rangers creates tools like these backpacks, um, test kits that give you the results in the field right away, compare it against professional probes. We we're just uh, launching a five-year project with University of Regina to, um, to compare that to professional probes and to contribute to bigger data sets. So as part of our open data platform, all the data that gets collected by our groups gets to go into bigger data repositories like data stream. Um, and, and what that means is that the data that communities are collecting can get into the hands of decision makers so that they have a voice in protecting their waterways. So you can check out waterrangers.ca, check out our new backpack, our open data platform, and I'd love to connect with you on um, anything to do with community-based water monitoring or uh, just getting outside and really really, really appreciating our local water bodies. So without further ado, it is time to announce the four teams that have been selected this weekend to move forward to the phase two and the final pitch competition. So I'm going to announce the teams in no particular order. There isn't a ranking, so don't take any consideration of, of which one I'm presenting first or second or third or fourth. Um, they're all incredible. And we're gonna be sharing their pitch so you can have an idea of what they've been working on to solve some of the most critical water issues in Western Canada. So if you're ready, we're ready. One of the top four teams to have been selected is from UBCO. It's the SIP team with their mobile filtration station. Congratulations, Team SIP. Water is the fundamental right of human health. Humans depend on water to fulfill their basic needs and would not be able to survive without it. There are currently 56 indigenous communities on water boil advisory. 56 communities whose rights to clean drinking water are constrained. Half of these advisories have remained unsolved for over a decade. 
A single drinking water advisory can deny up to 5,000 people the right to sipping on safe and clean drinking water. The current efforts to solve the disparity on reserves, the addition of chlorine as a water cleaning agent, or the building of aquifers result in long-term repercussions on the local ecosystems. Indigenous culture is planted firmly into Canadian history, and a strong connection to nature and obtaining water from natural resources like rivers and streams is deeply rooted into Indigenous culture. Now people are often taking gambles on hard metal contamination and other health concerns when gathering water as these sources can be polluted from upstream industry. An innovation that could address the issue of freshwater disparity would need to be sustainable and environmentally friendly. Economical, easily accessible, and culturally responsive. The longer this prevalent issue remains, the longer these communities are revoked of their right to a sip of water. SIP is an energy-free gravity filtration backpack and acts as a mobile filtration system and water dispenser and can filter one gallon of water in less than 10 minutes. The backpack comes in a one gallon or a five gallon size. There are three layers of filtration, the micron mesh sock filter to conduct surface filtration and remove larger sediments and debris, an activated carbon filter that eliminates the taste of chlorine and trace elements of heavy metals, and a membrane micron filter that uses reverse osmosis to filter through 99.99% of bacteria, microorganisms, and microplastics in water. The carbon filter can filter through 1,100 disposable water bottles worth of water before requiring its first replacement and over 3,700 bottles for the micron filter attachment. The backpack's interior is made of food grade silicone that's flexible, durable, leak free, and resistant to chemicals and debris. The 430 food grade stainless steel input and output caps are also resistant to chlorine and salts. This design also comes with a variety of accessories, including a tube and mouthpiece to drink water directly from the backpack, a spout, and a hook to hang the backpack. The primary filters at the bottom of the backpack can also be unscrewed and fit over top any standard cup to use as a filter straw. The technology used in the carbon, micron mesh, and membrane micron filters have been widely used in gravity filtration techniques and have successfully met national water testing standards. The SIP team has already been granted startup capital from the UBC Entrepreneurship, Innovation, and Impact Fund that will be used to conduct lab testing and iteration of the filters over summer 2021. Profits from selling the backpack could be used to provide free water testing kits for families, which would then fit within a specialized sleeve pocket on the backpack for ease of use. In order to effectively reduce water disparity, the SIP team will continue to work directly with Indigenous communities. A key component to this is the inclusion of cultural, historical, economic, and social considerations that are to be made in order for effective consultation with each community that SIP works with. The implementation of SIP backpacks strives to create a sense of engagement within a community where members can help distribute backpacks and determine further iterations to all aspects of the project. This innovation could be a step forward in promoting equity for Indigenous people in Canada and would be crucial as a short-term solution. The SIP backpack is also marketable to disaster relief and first response situations, where backpacks could be distributed to people and families without immediate clean drinking water. Due to the backpack's mobility, it can be used for communities that have to travel distances to obtain their water from wells, springs, or streams. It can also be sold for hiking and other outdoor activities, where people could bring their backpack with them on their outdoor adventures and have their water filtered for them as they go. This also extends to family outings in lieu of bringing water bottles. The backpack's stylish exterior is also a great addition to any home to act as a stationary water filter that can be hooked up on any ledge. If families are dependent on disposable water bottles, this would encourage the use of tap water and produce less plastic waste. Our project also incorporates a website and Instagram to attract attention on the issue, to update with communities in Canada that are on water boil advisory, and to educate on water testing standards. Through effective purification, education, innovation, and sustainability, our mission is to end water disparity. One sip at a time. Amazing! Let's discover the second team that has been selected.
There are six of them and they're from Kelowna, Calgary, Winnipeg and Vancouver. So the full of the Western Canada. Congratulations team Algae Gator. Let's discover your innovative solution to help remove toxic chemicals from freshwater bodies. Welcome. The Algae Gator is an on-farm nutrient capture and recycling device capable of removing toxic chemicals from freshwater bodies. Our group members are Matthew Hinchliffe, Omar Nuri, Eric Hole, Dolphin Chan, Sam Kanakin, and myself, Tanner Sheen. As farming and agriculture has advanced, the push to increase crop resilience and yield has led to increase in chemical fertilizers usage and although effective, they do come with cost. The main problems that our group set out to tackle are farmers losing fertilizer due to runoff and the detrimental effects these fertilizers can cause when reaching nearby water bodies. In these water bodies, the high concentrations of these chemicals leads to eutrophication and the creation of algae blooms. These algae blooms are not only responsible for the reductions of the water's oxygen content, but also for production of toxins that would render it non-potable for cattle and other farm animals. The farms of southern Alberta are no strangers to the effects of these algae blooms, their prevalence and their continued threat. Initially, we brought our focus here as ground zero for our research and eventually testing. However, in the future, we would plan to broaden our scope. The balance of sun and precipitation throughout the region while also lying next to the Rocky Mountains leads to increased runoff and for that reason has become the focus of our research. Hillard Farms expressed interest in the design and an expert farmer recommended that we get the recycled fertilizer certified for crop safety to gain repertoire in the farming community. The Algator Electrocoagulation Water Filtration System was developed in order to address the problem of toxic runoff polluting bodies of water. Electrocoagulation is a system that introduces a current to a solution to precipitate target chemicals through the use of an iron anode and an aluminium cathode. The helical cathode design was chosen specifically due to its low maintenance cost. In addition, solar energy is used to negate any negative impact to the environment. Water from the water body to be cleaned is pumped into the top of the electrocoagulation tank via a submersible 70 watt pump. Here it will sit for a specified amount of time during which an electric current will flow through the water to precipitate the contaminants thanks to the helical cathode and concentric anode. Once the designated amount of time is up, the treated water will flow down through the three-stage filter to remove the sludge and can then flow back into the body of water or possibly be collected for use on the farm. Our design is enclosed to protect the system from the element and is divided to separate the water filtration section from the electrical side with the inverter and battery for safety. The solar panel that powers the system is placed atop the system to be more compact and for easy accessibility. Since the SolidWorks design is built by assembly feature, most parts in the design can be replaced as they are worn out under an outdoor environment. The anode in particular is expected to be used up as it reacts via electrocoagulation in wastewater. Users can buy a replacement and install the components easily by themselves. Although there are many methods of filtration, electrocoagulation has several benefits for our situation. These include reduced sludge production and the avoidance of using non-reusable chemicals that have to be disposed of after. The installation of our product will allow farmers to recapture nitrates and phosphorus from crop runoff instead of entering bodies of water and causing economic and environmental damage. As previously mentioned, electrocoagulation holds several economic advantages over other filtration systems. To give an idea of the benefit, we found a study that compared the operating cost of electrocoagulation to chemical coagulation, which is another popular method of filtration. They found that electrocoagulation has significantly cheaper operating costs, which shows its effectiveness for our needs. We also identified a 70 watt pump that would meet our product's energy needs for $89.99 and was estimated to have annual upkeep costs of around $37 per year, assuming the pump is used for 8 hours a day, every day of the year. Finally, we found solar panels ranging from $30 to $130 that would meet our needs, and this expense would be very infrequent since solar panels have an average lifespan of 25 to 30 years. Now, as far as implementation for the electrocoagulation system is concerned, installing the device requires minimal effort as the system is placed close to the surface of the water and the intake pump rests at a slightly lower elevation to create water flow. Maintenance is relatively minimal as there are few components that deteriorate with a prolonged usage, with these components being the anode rod, filters, and the water pump, all of which are simple replacements. The frequency that the filters will have to be cleaned and emptied depends on the concentration of the nitrogen and the phosphorus in the water supply. The future of the algigator depends on producing a physical product to test on real bodies of water to further understand where improvements are required. 
The recapturing of the, these nutrients would also result in the possibility of reusing said nutrients instead of having to purchase more fertilizer, thus alleviating some of the farm's fertilizer expenses and environmental impact. Finally, we want to determine how to reduce the size of the design, ultimately with the goal of creating a portable system this is going to be useful for farmers who have multiple small bodies of water spread throughout their land. Now, thank you for watching. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Good work. That was very, very cool. The third team to join the cohort of finalists is a team from the University of Saskatchewan. Congratulations, Team Eco-Friendly Wastewater Treatment. Let's discover your promising innovation. Chemicals of Emerging Concern, a general code with specific problems. Throughout the last decade, the definition of contaminants of emerging concern has moved into an open-ended and ambiguous term. Currently, any compound that is not monitored but might enter the environment and potentially cause an adverse effect to the ecosystem or human health can be considered as an emerging compound. Between 1998 and 2007, spending on prescription drugs used outside of hospitals grew from $8 billion to $19 billion. It's estimated that the global pharmaceutical market will exceed $1.5 trillion by 2023. Emerging compounds could be classified into five main groups. Unfortunately, there is no regulatory agencies controlling their emission. In a study measuring contaminants in tap water, 316 contaminants were found from 20 million drinking water tests from 2004 till 2009, from which only 114 were contaminants with emission standard limit, while 202 contaminants were unregulated. In Canada, from 5,800 treatment systems, only 25% are advanced, uh, advanced processes, while the rest either not treated or pro processed in a conventional activated sludge system. These systems are also inefficient in removing emerging compounds, so the chemicals are being released into the environment through the wastewater treatment plant effluent system or the sludge. Despite low concentration, the pollutants are being accumulated in aquatic systems, causing endocrine disrupting effects, antibiotic resistance, and in some cases even extinction or biodiversity change in aquatic habitats. So, what's the solution? The treatment systems should be upgraded or optimized. Wastewater treatment plant fate models acting as a risk assessment tool gives us a better knowledge of the chemical distribution through the wastewater treatment plant. These models are being fed with the planned operational parameters and physiochemical properties. The model output also gives an idea of the possible additional removal processes like adsorption or advanced oxidation. Additionally, highest removals could be achieved by optimizing the planned operational parameters. So the fake model output could be fed into the genetic algorithm to give us an efficient operational parameters to maximize the removal of emerging compounds. However, Optimization of operational parameters to enhance the removal of emerging pollutants may not be able to completely remove them. Therefore, a final filtration can be considered to capture the remaining pollutants. There are different commercially available adsorbents like activated color or resins that can be used. Nevertheless, these adsorbents are also expensive and may not be appropriate for the targeted compounds. So, our solution is for this issue is using of agricultural residue for the adsorption preparation. Why? Because agricultural residues are abundant and available everywhere. For example, in Canada, about 48 million tons of about 48 million tons per year of agricultural residues are available that can be utilized for preparation of value-added products. Agricultural rates are cheap, which indicates their higher potential for our purpose of reducing the cost of filtration. Besides the availability and low cost, utilizing cost-effective adsorbents will benefit the agricultural industry by providing a new income avenue for farmers by using their agricultural residues. In addition, during the preparation procedure, we can apply a specific treatment to make the prepared adsorbents a selective and highly efficient one for the, tar for the targeted pollutants. Here, you can see some numbers that shows how using of agricultural residues in wastewater treatment in industry can be appealing. 
Iron exchange resins are widely used in wastewater with a market of $1.45 billion in 2015 and projected to increase in future. The cost of biochar prepared from straw, including the cost of har harvesting and transportation, can be one-fifth of activated carbon. In conclusion, our cost-effective and eco-friendly proposed method, including the optimization and absorption, will have the advantage of cost-effectiveness, new income avenue for farmers, and the method is applicable for municipal and hospital wastewater treatment plants, and each of these steps can be applied independently to any plant. Thank you. Well done, guys. And now, last but not least, here is the fourth team that have impressed the judges with their pitch and solution. They are also from UBCO. Congratulations, Team Triple C. Let's discover how you want to help improve water systems for Indigenous communities. Hello, everyone. The name of our team is System Contamination Control. Our team is made up of a small group of engineering students from the University of British Columbia, Okanagan campus. We chose to examine the use of and functions of the cisterns in indigenous communities, specifically looking at the reserve located in central Manitoba. Throughout Canada, many households do not have access to running water through pipe systems and instead rely on cisterns to supply potable water. Many of these households reside in reserves and indigenous communities where the houses are spread out and cannot otherwise be connected to pipes. The contamination of water in cisterns is much more common in pipe supplied water due to the nature of its transportation. In order for water to be delivered to a cistern, it travels by truck from the water treatment plant and then from house to house. During its transportation, there are many opportunities for contaminations. This can happen from dust filled up in the tank valve between houses as well as when the water is filled into the truck from the treatment center and from the truck to cistern. Also, contamination can come from dirt and foreign objects falling into the opening of the cistern, small animals and insects making their way in, or from dust collection and stagnant water. Indigenous communities are disproportionately represented when it comes to communities with frequent boil water advisories. A lack of clean drinking water can result in a series of health issues. As well, it can be expensive and inconvenient when households are otherwise forced to purchase or boil their water instead. Sandy Bay First Nation, a reserve in Manitoba, is one such community that relies on truck delivery of water to supply potable water to households. While the main water line from that water treatment plant is able to reach 70% houses, the remaining 30% still require water delivery services. The process of cleaning a contaminated cistern is extensive, consisting of draining out, disinfecting, and shocking the cistern. Cleaning the cistern takes about three days, but it can take months for a cleaning request to be fulfilled, and cisterns are very difficult to clean in the winter. During this time, the household is left without clean running water. The final proposed solution to reduce the contamination of cisterns in indigenous communities is a hydraulic coupling and attachments to both the delivery truck and the opening of the cistern. The coupling comes in two parts, the male end attaching to the end of those normally used to deliver water from the truck to the cistern, while the female part attaches to a base leading into the opening of the cistern. The main purpose of the couplings is to reduce the amount of dirt and dust that is able to make into the supply and transfer into the cistern. The coupling, the couplings made from a durable plastic automatically seal off when detached, ensuring that water flowing through them cannot be contaminated by the like around the hose during transportation or during water transfer. This ensures when water is transported from house to house, dirt cannot collect inside the hose and enter the water supply. The silicon lining within the coupling ensures a tight seal on both ends. The base of the system secures over the opening of the cistern. Depending on the diameter of the cistern, various rubber bushings can be used to ensure an airtight fit. PVC pipes extend from the base into a rounded candy cane shape with the end fitted with the female coupling. The rounded down shape of the PVC pipes encourages any dirt or rainwater to drain away from the opening of the cistern. A second set of PVC pipes extends from the base, which allows for pressure regulation when water is added and released from the cistern. A mesh layer extends across the cross section of the pipe in order to prevent any dust or dirt from making its way into the water supply. By decreasing the risk of contamination, the cisterns won't have, have to be cleaned as frequently. As well, it will ensure that the households are able to consistently receive safe potable water. The problem was highlighted by one of our teammate members, Sydney, as herself, as she herself uses water supplied from a cistern. We collaborated with various communities to obtain info about the problem at hand. During these efforts, we were able to design our product with the background research and feedback to cater to the community in mind. The pro this product was designed and intended for use on household cisterns in Indigenous communities. The initial implementations will primarily focus on reserves where the delivery of water is overseen by water truck service. 
This product may be applicable for any individual whose household has water supplied from a sister net who manages their own water delivery. This product can be applied across Canada in any community where cisterns are used, typically rural communities. Some of the things that we believe the NACO project successful is that there is limited access to specific information regarding the existing problem, which could be only obtained by communicating with the locals. There are no similar products on the market. Our solution is cost effective compared to other solutions. Our first milestone will be making a fully functional one-to-one -one scaled prototype, which will allow us to know the exact cost of our product and test our final design. Next, we're planning to implement the product and evaluate its functionality and its effectiveness of preventing the contamination in its intended environment. We have several households willing to try the attachment to test its feasibility, as well as a community willing to help with its development. We hope to collaborate with the leaders in these communities in order to efficiently implement our solution. We aim to solve the problem by eliminating the cost, not consequences. Well, that was impressive. It's official. We have our four finalist teams from the Western Canada Aqua Hacking Challenge. Congratulations, everyone. I know how hard you've worked to get to this place, and I'm so impressed with what you've done. We're really looking forward to seeing how far you have developed your solutions and projects by the final pitch competition in September. Okay, that's all for me today. I'll see you by the lake. Get your water testing gear out. The next water testing day is May 30th. Back to you, Anna. Thank you, Kat, and congratulations to all of the finalists who will now begin phase two of the challenge. I wanna give a very warm Western Canada thank you to everyone who participated today. We admire your ambition and your passion for water. We're gonna do everything that we can to support the development of your innovations. Thanks again also to all of our partners, to the advisory committee, to the water issue leaders and the judges, and thanks to all of you who are in the viewing audience today. We'll see you on September 14th for the grand finale and the announcement of the winners. So best wishes to all the teams. Get going, folks, and goodbye for now.